Hola a todos, welcome back to the Bruja Cat channel. So today is going to be the start to a new phase for this YouTube channel. It's going to be including a wider lens of cultural anthropology as a whole. So even though I specialize in Latin American mythology and folklore, I am interested in folklore from around the world. And so I'm hoping that you will come along with me on this journey and we can talk about different sort of cultural anthropology internationally. We can talk about cultural anthropology, linguistics, philosophy, religion, sociology, uh, spirituality, different cultural customs, how they are similar and different to ours. And I think by casting a wider lens this way I don't alienate the audience as well and we can have a broader spectrum of cultural anthropology overall. So if this is something that you're interested in, then make sure you subscribe and follow me for more videos. Now today's video is going to be a two-parter. Part one is going to be discussing the Taino language grammatical syntax, and then part two is going to be discussing a false cognate between the Taino language and Latin. So the first thing that you need to know about the Caribbean is that it's not a monolith. There are different varieties and different ethnic groups of indigenous peoples in the Caribbean. Here is just a short list of a few and some maps to help you visualize. So as you can see, there are many nations and tribes to the Caribbean, each with their own unique heritage and culture. Archaeological evidence also shows that the predecessor to these classical indigenous nations in the Caribbean would have sailed through the south of the Caribbean Sea from the Yucatan Peninsula and South America in modern-day Colombia and Venezuela up through the Virgin Islands. Due to these migration patterns, along with enough time and isolation, other languages in the indigenous Caribbean family group have formed. This has resulted in a lot of Caribbean indigenous languages having the same or similar grammatical syntax, along with borrowing loan words from neighboring nations in Central and South America. With the expansion of colonialism extending into the Americas, the indigenous people would then become more culturally and ethnically diverse. Many indigenous to the Caribbean are now multiracial due to forceful assimilation or intermarriage. With the Spanish caste system classifying race and class in the social status being of particular influence. Different European and Indonesian powers have radically changed the languages that are spoken in the Caribbean today, with the African influence also creating different Creole or Pidgin languages in the Caribbean as well. But for the purposes of today's video, we're going to be focusing on one little island that is close to my heart, Puerto Rico or Borican. So we're going to be talking about the indigenous language to the classical Taino ethnic group of Borican. Now it's important to note that the Taino language is technically classified as a dead language in the same manner that Latin is viewed as a dead language as well. There's still many speakers and scholars and tons of applicability such as the Catholic Church, um, different cities like the Vatican. It's taught in schools as a bridge language for second language learners. And in fact, I tutored Latin for the Upward Bound program for high school students. So even though something is technically classified as a dead language, there is still applicability in our modern day for these languages to exist. And there are still several students that can still benefit from it for scholarly education to learn about linguistics from family heritages and how different ethnic groups may have related family lineage for their linguistics. So even though something is technically a dead language, there's still tons of modern day applicability. There are still speakers that can read, write, and understand it. Uh, there's still many different ways that we can utilize technically dead languages in our modern day. Okay, so let's get started. Part one, we're gonna be talking about the Taino language syntax. So the main three books that I'm gonna be talking about today include this one, Voces de Bojio by Rafael Garcia Bido, Keeping the Taino Language Alive by Richard Porata, and Primario Básico del Taino Borica Naiki by Javier A. Hernández. Also, I'd like to mention that in the description of this video, you will find a link to my link tree, and on there, there is a category called Taino references and hyperlinks. This will lead you to a public master document with tons of references and hyperlinks that will bring you to Taino resources about their culture, heritage, and language. So if you're interested in learning more beyond just this one video, definitely go check out that link. So first off, we have the Voces de Bojio Dictionary. I have a love-hate relationship with this book because it is strictly from Taino into Spanish, which makes it terrible to try to translate anything. <laughs> 
but this book is still a fantastic resource taking into account first-hand heraldry from indigenous descendants and chroniclers from all over the Caribbean. I will also put up all of the references and sources that this author gives for this book now! So make sure to pause the video if you'd like to read those. Now, I will say that this dictionary is fantastic for also giving context to some of these words. So it's not just giving you definitions, it's also giving you a story with some of these going on for literally like a few paragraphs to describe who this person was, um, the history behind this word or the place. There are also different Taino words for specific types of fish that he translates not only into the common Spanish word for it, but also like the technical scientific species of that fish. So you know exactly what they're talking about. And also the same thing for different species of trees. If you're particularly interested in botany or herbology and would like to know what sort of holistic remedies and medicinal plants would the Taino people use, definitely check out this book, Earth and Spirit, Medicinal Plants and Healing Lore from Puerto Rico by Maria Benedetti. Now, before I dive into the books about Taino grammatical syntax, I'd like to leave it up to you, the audience, to decide which one of these you would prefer. Um, it's just important to note that when it comes to dead language reconstruction for modern day revitalization, this is a very tricky subject because, first and foremost, it's very difficult to try to research, obviously. So this is something that takes many, many years and is a collaboration between different linguistic experts. So I'll leave it up to you, the audience, uh, to decide which one of these you would prefer, not only for the paleontology um, to study how this language would have been used more accurately historically, but also in its modern day applicability for revitalization efforts. Now, one fine example of this are revitalization efforts by linguists and Taino enthusiasts to make a Taino written alphabet. So there are different Taino syllabaries that are available on omniglot.com, one that was invented by Miguel A. Sage Jr. Sobacao Coromo, or Black Ribs. And also the Nahuaque Taino pictographic alphabet invented by Dr. Yare Melendez in 2005. So in the introduction to the Primerio Básico de Taino Boricanaiki by Javier A. Hernández, this book was written to help with the restoration of ancestral language of Puerto Rico or Borican. In the introduction, he discusses how the reconstruction efforts of different Caribbean regional languages such as Garifuna and Wayunaiki were used. Um, so then that way people can extrapolate how to recreate the Taino language as well. So if you're interested in learning more about these Caribbean indigenous languages, I highly suggest following the other YouTube channel, I Love Languages, who discuss Wayu, Carib, and many more, along with Masa Man, who discusses who are the Creoles, and the Lang Focus channel, who talks about the different Creoles, Pigeon languages, and Patois that are found in the Caribbean. There are also efforts to reconstruct the Taino indigenous language by looking at different vocabulary terms that were fused with modern day Spanish and that are still used today. So just a few examples of this would be words like manati, amaca, tiburón, tabaco, or just looking at a map of the Caribbean where many of the islands are still using the indigenous names for each one of them. The author goes on to mention how modern-day Hebrew, as recognized by the state of Israel, was not only a fusion of Biblical Hebrew, European languages, Arabic, Yiddish, and much more, but in that same visualization that Taino can be extrapolated from modern-day use in other languages. So in order to explain this method more simply, the author goes on to say, imagine for a moment if Spanish suddenly disappeared off of the face of the earth, there is no more Spanish speakers, no more native speakers. Spanish is a technically dead language, an extinct language. How would then modern day people extrapolate what Spanish is? So how would they reconstruct Spanish? This is the task that is given to people trying to reconstruct the Taino language. So it's this effort in order to reconstruct Spanish, after centuries of people not speaking it, um, they would have to look at languages from their linguistic family trees such as Catalan, French, Italian, Portuguese, or even the root of all Romance languages, Latin, in order to extrapolate from there which words were used in Spanish. However, with revitalization efforts like this, the historical accuracy of those words is always up to speculation because 
the way that people used to speak Spanish is different from the way that modern day Spanish is. So this is something that linguists and researchers are very aware of, the way that language changes over time. So one way that we can think of it is medieval English. There is Old English, Middle English, Modern Day English, there's even slang English, there's regional differences in how we speak English. Um, a different example we could use is the way that Spanish differs according to region as well. So there are perhaps 13 different ways in Spanish that you can say the word straw, like a straw to drink from, according to whichever country that you're in. It doesn't mean that anyone is incorrect. We can look into the etymology of the word straw in Spanish from many different angles, but this just helps to illustrate that language differs according to who is speaking it, where you're speaking it, and what time you're speaking it in. Now, I do want to mention that if any one of you is interested in following a lesson plan that is directly derived from this book, definitely go check out the YouTube channel Casa Areto. They're great in helping with lesson plans and making it a little bit easier and a little bit more applicable to modern day. Now, before we get into the real nitty and gritty of grammatical syntax for the Taino Borica Nike language, I want to give a little disclaimer. So my goal for this video is not to give you vocabulary, it's to give you grammatical syntax. That way later on you can input any kind of vocabulary that you're currently learning. So nouns, verbs, adjectives, and input them into this linguistic equation. Also, for simplicity hereafter, I'm just going to be referring to this language as Taino because it's a mouthful. Also, be aware this book is only in Spanish, so I'm going to be translating through three different languages. That way I don't leave any English monolinguals out of the loop. So this is just going to be a rapid fire listing of the lesson plans in this book, and I'm also going to put up some graphic text to help out with visualization and any note taking you guys want to take. So because the writing system was reconstructed from different linguistic efforts to revitalize this language, um, do keep in mind the Taino people had no formal writing system. They just had visual representations of their culture through petroglyphs that can still be seen today, not only in Puerto Rico, but throughout the Caribbean as well. So just keep in mind that it really doesn't matter how you write it or the correct spelling that you use um, with the Roman alphabet. Just know as long as the phonetic sounds are the same, that's what really matters. So first up, we have the alphabet. So we have A-E-I-O-U, but this book gives no context on how to phonetically pronounce these vowels. So we're going to assume the Spanish vowels are being used here. Alphabet consonants are also included and special syllables such as the ñ. H is only used with SH to make the SH and CH, which makes a sort of X sound. At the end of a word, the X makes an X sound. So in order to indicate gender or plurality, you would include the suffix kyo for masculine, che for feminine, or nagu for plurality, tacked onto the end of the noun. Pronouns listed here include dak for I, buk for you, lik for him, tuk for her, guajotik for formal you, wak for us, huk for plural you, Nak for them, hak for them, these are different gendered versions. Nahak for y'all in a group of mixed gender. Now these pronouns may come under scrutiny when it comes to comparing its direct translation from catering to Spanish pronouns being gender specific, particularly with the plural gendered ellos, ellas, them, and formal usted or you, and the mixed group for vosotros. So I'll leave that up to you, the audience, to decide. Um, this is just pure speculation, but it is something to keep in mind as well. Lesson three, verbs and conjugation. So to use a verb, attach the proper pronoun in front as a prefix to that verb to indicate who is doing it. Also, all prefixes and suffixes are attached by either an apostrophe or hyphen. Lesson four is negation. So to give connotation in the negative. To use negation, like I do not or did not verb, start with a pronoun, insert mat after the pronoun as a suffix and attach the verb to it. So lesson five is verb tenses, progressive, past, and future tense. She is the progressive, itpa is the past, ina is the future. These are all suffixes. So attach it after the verb to add tense. Lesson six is essential verbs, to be, the self indicator, and conjugation is toca. So examples of this in conjugation include dak toca, I am, or being, 
Daktoka Shi, I have been Daktoka Itpa, I was Daktoka Inna, I will be. So to use this insert toka after the pronoun with the proper conjugation, then add a noun. To be or the location of is moon. So for example, dak moon boriken, I'm in boriken or Puerto Rico. Other verb conjugations includes to go, which is iba or ir in Spanish. So dak iba, yo voy, I go. Dak iba shi, yendo, I am going. Dak iba itpa, yo fui. I went, dak iba inna, yo ire, I will go. So this way, using these suffixes, you can create the progressive past and future tense to these verbs in the same way. So all these things were covered in lesson five with the noun coming after the verb tense. So lesson seven, the book goes on to describe the same past, present, and future tense uh, with different verbs such as agama for to have, uh, guarico to come, asheka to want, Inra to do, Mushika to give. Now, I don't want to spend too much time here because, like I said, this is all vocabulary that you can just simply insert into the Taino syntax and grammar later on. Now, in lesson nine, we're talking about possession. No, not the ghost type. <laughs> we mean as in possessing something. So add the at to the proper pronoun to create a possessive, such as dak at, mine, book at, yours. So just go back in the lesson plan to the previous pronouns that were listed and add an at to the end to make it into a possessive. Lesson 10, adjectives and adverbs. They go after the subject and verb, that's it. Next, skipping to lesson 12, we have interrogatives, question words. Where is Amana? What is Gatei? Who is Harai? Why is Anake? How is Ida? When is Bena? Which is Haralu? And how much? is ida teketa. Then lesson 14 we have prepositions and conjunctions. Instead of going through all of them, I'm simply going to list them here for you guys to check out. So these are just really important for forming any kind of question, you know, any kind of sentence, any kind of conversation, trying to make your point clear to the person. That's it. Everything else is just added vocabulary. So this is just the general backbone outline to understanding the Taino Borike Naiki according to this book so that you can understand the grammatical syntax and just input the vocabulary that you're learning over time. Vocabulary when you're studying another foreign language is something that you just accumulate with time. So knowing the linguistic formula is the first step. Now, there is something that I want to talk about in particular with this author. Um, he doesn't really cite his sources. There's no bibliography or anything. It's just listed in the introduction that Javier is a linguist, hyperglot, and patriot. He also mentions in the introduction that he read Diccionario Taino Ilustrado by Edwin Minersola, which after reading, the author began writing a grammatical structure to the Taino language starting in 2003. Then in 2013, he communicated with Dr. Yari Melendez, who, as you remember, started the pictographic alphabet for the Taino language. And so he communicated with the Taino community in Puerto Rico, where he continued to work with the Pramerio, with the Pramerio Basico to start forming the grammatical syntax and language for the Taino people. It wasn't until later that he took a DNA test to reaffirm he did in fact have Taino lineage in his heritage. So that's when he dove into his project, uh, publishing his work later on in 2017, only four years later. So he also includes in his book a page of 16 suggestions of how to promote the Taino language, which includes um, a whole variety, of course. But what struck me as odd is that he included forming a committee to add Taino Borike Naiki to Wikipedia to officially register the language to an international level through omniglot.com by using the ISO 639-3 and collaborating with Microsoft and Apple to add this language like they did with YU to elaborate to a new dictionary of technology terms. I'll put this up on the screen here so then that way any Spanish speakers can try to see if my translation is correct or not, or if there's further context that I may be misreading. Um, this book is also very poorly organized with vocabulary. It didn't list conjunctions for the essential words that were listed in lesson 14, and it has a few Spanish writing errors as well. So extrapolate from that what you will. Next, let's go on to our second book, Keeping the Taino Language Alive by Richard Porrata. 
So this book involves advanced studies in Taino syntax, which we're going to compare to the previous book. But do keep in mind that these are two completely different authors. Now, Richard Porata, in the introduction of this book, goes on for like 11 pages. <laughs> he studied language, specifically the Taino language, for about 30 years total. Um, he studied it for 24 years before he enrolled in university for the American Indian Linguistics at University of Oregon, Northwest Indian Language Institute, so that definitely makes him accomplished as a linguist. He was also a language instructor at the University of Puerto Rico's Multilingual and Cultural Institute Division of Continuing Education, along with the U.S. Army Language Center. In the introduction to his book, he gives thanks and references a list of people, which I'll put up here. He also compared Taino with other Caribbean regional or ethnic languages, such as Lokono Arawak, Kaliniago, Caribe, and Garifuna, along with mentioning the creolization of Timucua language in southern Florida for migration routes that influenced Taino. He also mentions that in the same way that Old English and Old Spanish have modernized for our daily use today, that Old or Paleo Taino must also modernize for our daily use and applicability. The author also suggests not only using his book, but using other dictionaries and thesauruses in tandem. So some of the dictionaries that he recommends include Diccionario de Voces Indígenas de Puerto Rico by Dr. Luis Hernández Aquino, professor of history at University of Puerto Rico. Voces de Bojio, Vocabulario de la Cultura Taína by, wouldn't you know it, Rafael García Vido, <laughs> who's a professor of literature at University of Puerto Rico and Diccionario Taino Ilustrado by Eben Miner Sola. That's the dictionary that initially inspired the previous author, Javier Hernandez. And Diccionario Caraibe Francois by Reverend Pierre Raymond Breton, along with just using a thesaurus. He also suggests a few other books, Arqueología Lingüística, Estudios Modernos Dirigidos al Rescate y Reconstrucción del Arabeco Taino by Manuel Álvarez Nazario. That is a long name, dude. <laughs> Along with Languages of Pre-Columbian Antilles by Julian Granbury and Gary S. Vesilius. I hope I'm pronouncing those right. So just to give you a clear picture, all of his acknowledgments and the introduction of this book is super long but extremely insightful with linguistic knowledge. So it's evident that this guy knows what he's talking about and can back it up. Uh, there's even a bibliography at the end with properly cited sources. Pull it up. Wow. wow. And he also wrote a few other books which he mentions at the back page. I'll put those images up now. So let's hop into it. For the Keeping the Taino Language Alive Advanced Taino Syntax, we're going to be covering part one of this book and a little bit of part two, just to cover what the important grammatical syntaxes are in this Advanced Taino Language book. Um, we're going to be going straight to the point and I'm going to add graphic text. Uh, keep in mind the author also notes that this book describes the Taino language not as authentically paleo, but as a contemporary Taino language that can be used in a modern sense. Lesson one is vowels. Here the author gives the proper phonetic pronunciation of these vowels. Thank God. <laughs> I'll put them up on this list here where he compares it to the different vowels found in English. I also want to note that the G in gua is often mistaken for a hard G, but it's a unique sound of its own, similar to the Spanish gue. And here the G sounds more like a W, like in the word sinvergüenza or guaraguao, where the hard G is pronounced less percussively and with more breath like a W. Another fun example we can use is la guagua. Now this is a fun colloquial term used throughout the Caribbean region that simply means the bus. The etymology of the term guagua comes directly to us from the Taino language, and it means for free. This refers to what our modern sense would call carpooling, where many people share a ride for free, or referring to when public transportation didn't cost anything. So this is something that's extremely common in the Hibaro regional accents in Puerto Rico, uh, which is a direct descendant of the Taino idiolects found in the mountainous region of the island. And it's something that is still evident today for Puerto Rican Spanish speakers. My family definitely uses regional Puerto Rican accents, such as like the mountainous Hibaro accent, which I would love to cover more in depth in a future video discussing Puerto Rican accents in general, which are regional in themselves. So not only are we strange like in the Spanish speaking world, but we are strange like regionally as well, just on our little 100 mile island. 
As for other consonants, the X sounds are more pronounced like a sh or ch. A prime example of both of these in use for the vowels and consonants is the often mispronounced Taino semi name, this one, <laughs> which should actually phonetically sound like guabansesh. Session two is pronouns. Now, in this book, it differs a bit from the previous author because they're not deriving exactly from a Spanish version of pronouns with a Taino filter on top of it. So there are less gendered pronouns. But here the author lists the different uh, pronouns as da for I, tu for she, li or lu for him, li as in it, that, this, which can be used for like non-binary people, bu for you or your, na for they, them, their, which I believe is more for like pluralization of a pronoun, and gua for we, ours, us. But in this book, he does explain that gua, wa, wo, and guo are pronouns used by some regional dialects. Session three, pronouns in the present tense. So here the author explains how to use verbs in the present tense, which is just by attaching it after the pronoun as a suffix and gives examples of using present tense verbs in a sentence. So section four covers the different conjugations for the word to be in the present tense. So if you want to use this verb according to whichever pronoun it is that you use, the singular ones will use the word ga, meaning is, and the plural pronouns will use the word to, meaning are. Here I just skip forward to section five so I can get all the mouth-watering verb tense conjugations. Section five involves how to conjugate the different Taino tenses. So I'll just read off of the book here. Bo is the present continuous tense. Ba is the past tense. B is the past continuous tense. Buna is the perfect past tense. Fa is future simple text. Fabi is future perfect tense. Ka is the perfect tense. So here the author gives the different verb conjugations that can be used. Ba is the equivalent to the ending ed, ed, past tense in English. B is the equivalent to the ing form in past continuous English. Buna is the had in English perfect tense. Fa is the shall or will in the English future simple tense. Fabi is like the shall have or will have in English future tense, and ka is like a past participle of have in the English perfect tense. It also can be speculated that these tenses were pulled directly from the English version of tenses using that grammatical syntax borrowed from English uh, with a Taino filter over top of it as well. But uh, the sources of the vocabulary are sound as outlined in the introduction and the bibliography. So how to use these tenses in a sentence? Just put them as a suffix to a verb. So in this section, the author describes that definite articles such as a or an don't really exist, like they aren't really used in this Taino syntax for the context of this language in the same way that they are in English. Um, he goes on to display different various complex sentences in Taino, including adjectives and adverbs in order to give proper examples of this advanced structure. And for anyone interested, it seems to be using the SVO structure for grammatical syntax. But please correct me if I'm wrong. This is just an observation from all of the examples that he gave. He also includes the word moon, which is a preposition meaning two or four, which can be used in the sentence structure as well. So next up are the Taino prefixes in section six. So we already covered all of the Taino pronouns. The examples that he gives for prefixes include that for possessiveness. So possession, to have something, is just the letter K with a dash, meaning to have. So he then gives several examples of how to use this possessive article in Taino. So you would start with whichever pronoun, add the K as the possessive article, and then a noun. So if you want to say, I have corn, you would say, Dak mahisi, I have corn. But I also want to read this paragraph specifically mentioned by the author about the word ka. Ka is a definite article when affixed to a noun means the. Do not get the definite article ka confused with the suffix ka from the Taino root word toka, meaning to be, or ka, which means best. That's ka with an accent. He also mentions that the way that you use ka differs in definition according to how it functions in the sentence. So remember, ka as a prefix is different from ka as a singular word, which is different from the letter cake as a prefix as well. So I mentioned 
at the beginning of this section of the video that how you write things in Taino doesn't matter, but that the pronunciation is correct. So in this instance, you have different homophones, meaning that they sound the same, but in the context of the sentence may have different definitions. So this is something to keep in mind as well in Taino. Next is negation. Ma, or just the letter M as a prefix, is attached to verbs, nouns, and adjectives to create a negative or negatory connotation. So negation can be used in either full complex sentences or just as an expletive. Uh, he gave the example, ma yani, meaning stop it. So yani meaning to do or make. And then ma as the negation. And then when it comes to nouns, verbs, and adjectives beginning with the letter A, the ma will then be shortened to just the letter M to fuse those two words together with the prefix. Now I'm giving you the two for one deal, diving head first non-stop into session seven, Taino suffixes. Now I forgot to record this, but abo is a suffix that just means with. So you can attach this as a suffix to a verb, a noun, an adjective, and it just means with. It's pretty easy. And then the verbs can then be modified with the na at the end as a verb designator. The same can be done with modifying nouns with ri or te suffix as noun designators. Note that ri is only in relation to human beings, not animals or inanimate things. And then the same goes with adjectives and te as the designator for both nouns and adjectives. Tan simply means of. And the author notes that no one presently knows of any feminine suffixes, so we can use tan as a genderless suffix or a suffix regardless of gender of an inanimate noun as well. So we can use tan as a non-affiliation to mean about or of. No is the Taino suffix for pluralization of a noun or pronoun. So for example, Latino. And trust me, we'll get into that and dissect it in part two of this video. Next. Te is the suffix used to attach to a noun in order to make it an adjective. So this requires adding ma as a prefix as well in order to negate that. So if you want to say toothless, for example, you would want to use the word for tooth, which is ahi. So then add the prefix ma and then the suffix te and you have toothless. If you want to include a pronoun as well, you can say luca mahite. He is toothless. And then the other suffixes that the author mentioned was ato or to, which are more complex suffixes that the author was still currently researching. And this is another paragraph that I definitely want to read straight out of the source material for you. Ato, to are more complex suffixes that I am still currently researching. They may have entered the Taino language by another people from the Yucatan or Mississippi River Valley. At present, I do not find these suffixes related to the Arawak language family. This does not mean that they are not, but only time will tell. However, I know that ato, to, are attached to a verb that describes an existing condition of being. Think of Taino verbs using the suffix ato, to, in the same manner as static verbs in the English language that do not use the suffix ing, ing, in English, as a continuous tense. I think this is fantastic for a linguist to include that he doesn't have all the answers, but only time and more research will tell. So hopefully more collaborations with other linguists who study the Taino language family and other regional dialects, regional indigenous languages from that area in the Caribbean and the surrounding continents as well will help us gain more insight and answers to this. Um, I think it's also great to keep in mind that this is a reconstructed language. So of course it's going to be difficult to find answers immediately, but it's also a great highlight of loan words that we use from other languages. So uh, the fact that he mentioned that some of these words may be borrowed from the Yucatan Peninsula or the Mississippi River Valley um, shows migration routes from the Taino people all throughout the Caribbean. And these could be loan words that were used in Taino as well. So this is something that happens in many languages, especially English, where loan words are used all the time. And then na is a suffix attached to a noun to represent a person, place, or thing as insignificant or small. Now skipping forward to different sections of the book, the author then discusses the different question words, so the interrogatives. Who is Kata? What is Kat? Where is Aoti? When is Bena? Why is Anake? And how is Kat? 
And in previous sections where we talked about ma as a negative connotation, he also has a section in session 10 about forming the negative using wa, meaning not or no. So if someone is asking you a question, you would say, um, I am not as a negative connotation, a negative present marker. So you can say daka wa, I am not. So this is another way that you can answer questions and form questions. And that's pretty much it. I think um, from gaining all this insight from advanced Taino syntax and grammar from this book by Richard Porata, we can then input any kind of vocabulary that we are currently learning and accumulating into that linguistic equation. Um, I think it's great because then you can start creating sentences, forming conversations, or even writing songs. And in fact, I have a video that I made about how I made my Taino rap songs, literally step-by-step step deconstructing how I wrote this and how I came about um, not only the rhyming scheme, but also like grammatical syntax and how I wrote each verse. So if you're interested in that, please let me know in the comments section and then I'll make it public to everybody. All right, now it's time for part two of this video where we're talking about the Taino Latino false cognate discussion. So on my TikTok, I made a video about a false cognate that I discovered while studying the Taino language that I thought I'd share as a lighthearted and cute video, right? Right. So the reason I'm discussing this here on YouTube rather than on TikTok is because of the length of the video. I want to be able to discuss the full context about what my intent was and have a discussion about linguistics and the Taino advanced syntax, which is why I wanted to talk about this in part two after I divulged everything dissecting the Taino grammar and syntax. So if you're interested in understanding what the controversy online was all about, allow me to elaborate using one simple answer. False cognates. So in order for me to discuss what false cognates are, I first have to explain what a cognate is so that we can discuss the different types of false cognates found in linguistics. Talk about overkill. So a cognate is a word that stems from the same linguistic origins from the same family tree. This is why a lot of Latin or Romance based languages have a lot of words in common because they stem from the same family heritage. And this is why someone like me who already knew a lot of Romance languages that were based in Latin and able to continue learning other Latin based languages and why it makes sense to my ear just upon hearing it because of different homophones that they share and cognates that they share. Cognates can definitely help someone who's already familiar or fluent in a Latin based language to understand other Latin based languages without being fully fluent. So this way, you can have a shorthand to understand what these words mean without being fully familiar with these other languages. So if you're bilingual, this allows you to extrapolate from a word and what that might mean from another language because of similar meaning, phonetics, or just extrapolating the definition from Latin. You can then apply that onto the modern day use of that word in the Romance family. So a good example of a cognate that we can have fun with is the word pertaining to the sea, maritime. So mar is a loan word from Latin, mar meaning the sea. So we can extrapolate maritime is time spent in the sea in English. Now, we can also find the root word mar in other Latin-based languages, such as in Spanish, mar is the exact same meaning the sea. However, the valve phenomes can differ according to different Romance languages uh, while retaining the same consonants and the root word's meaning. So, for example, in Italian, mare and French, mer are still cognates with Latin. So that means that they retain the same sound and definition. This is used a lot in English where cognates are from loan words borrowed from other language families, um, but they still retain the same sound and definition. The main difference in English being that they're using English syntax in their grammar. So they can use a loan word and kind of bastardize it, which is why English is kind of known as like the worldwide bastardized language. Now, cognates differ from homophones, homographs, and homonyms because of spelling and definition or the sound. Here's a handy graph of how to explain this because I'm sure it's complicated. It also depends on the language family heritage, so where this word comes from in the use of a certain language, how they are literally related, and how they are correlatedly related. 
So let's continue using our mar example from Latin. In the French language, the word mer is a cognate with the Latin mar, right? So they both mean the sea. But in French, mer, mer, and mer are different homophones with the same sound but different definitions. So to keep it simple, cognates can sound the same or slightly similar or be spelled the same or slightly similar and retain the same definition because they're from the same root language. Cognates can also borrow words from the same language family, so the family tree heritage of how they're literally related versus correlatedly related. Um, and they can even change a little bit over time, become their own language and have little language babies of their own as well, but they would still be cognates. So next, what does a false cognate mean? So a false cognate is when two words from different languages use the same sound, um, are spelled the same or similar, or have the same definition in combination with the sound and spelling by sheer coincidence, but do not have the same linguistic family heritage, so they are not related. Now, the difference between false cognates and loan words is a bit tricky, so allow me to elaborate by giving you an example between Spanish and Arabic. So Spanish and Arabic have a partial false cognate because of a loan word. That sounds super complicated, right? So allow me to give you a visualization. In Arabic, o ala means God willing or God let it be. This was adopted in Spain when Spain was heavily influenced by the Middle East and the Arabic world by the Moors that were in Spain. So this is not only influencing their language but also like their everyday life and their culture. So their architecture, um, their cuisine, things like coffee, um, their customs, everyday life. It wasn't just their language, but we do have several loan words that are partial false cognates to Arabic in Spanish that we still use in our modern day Spanish. So words like azucar, azucar, or words like alzate become aceite, or even words like oala become ojala. Much of Arabic influence upon Spanish came through the various Arabized Romance dialects that were spoken in areas under Moorish rule, known today by scholars as Mozarabic. This resulted in Spanish often having both Arabic and Latin-derived words with the same meaning. And in fact, the I Love Languages YouTube channel has a video about Spanish and Mozarabic, so you should definitely check that out. So, linguistically, these are labeled as partial false cognates because it comes from a loan word from a different family origin. So they're basically adopted. <laughs> now let me give you examples of different types of false cognates. False homophone cognates that use similar sound and pronunciation, false homograph cognates that use similar spelling, false homophone synonym cognates that use similar sounds and definition in combination, false homograph synonym cognates that have similar spelling and definition in combination, false what I call doppelganger, so clone synonym cognates that have similar sound and spelling and definition in combination, so they're exact clones but it's by sheer coincidence. So a few funny examples of these would be the English word embarrassed and the Spanish word embarazada. I'm sure you've heard of this in your high school Spanish class. Um, the English word pantsuit and the Japanese word pantsu. And then my favorite false cognate of all time is the Spanish word pan and the Japanese word pan. They're not related whatsoever, but they're exact doppelganger false cognates. So the main thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with false cognates is their etymology, their language origin group, the origin of the word that doesn't stem in the same family group. Um, so linguistically, they may sound the same, they have the same spelling, the same definition, but these may arise by sheer coincidence. And honestly, they're really fun linguistically because you can create a lot of puns, like international linguistic puns. And I love this so much. I love false cognates, they're so great but they can create different embarrassing situations like the word embarrassed in English and embarrassada in Spanish. So different false cognates can sometimes fool people that are monolingual trying to learn their first second language. Or if you're cross-referencing different words, you have to look out for different false cognates. 
Now, the big problem that usually arises from false cognates are different contentious misunderstandings. So when people fall for false cognates and they believe that they are connected or when they can see that what they are presented with is a false cognate, but they don't believe that the other party understands that it's a false cognate, that they think that they fell for the false cognate. So with all of this in mind, check out my TikTok video about the false cognate between Taino Borike Nike and Latin, Latino. Check it out. Here's a Taino word you didn't know, Latino. As in Latino gang. Latin means heart, no makes it plural. Of course, the etymology of Latino America comes from Latin, but I like the idea of reclaiming it for Taino Latino. Okay, so to help clarify this video, we're going to look directly to the Voces de Bojo book. Here you can see Lati means heart, and then we're going to use it in tandem with the Keeping the Taino Language Alive book, where no is the suffix to make something plural. So, Latino. It's a false cognate. It's a pun! And I by no means am correlating this with anyone's opinion of colonization of the Americas. I just thought it would be adorable to have this interpretation of Latino America, meaning the hearts of America. And so the Taino vocabulary gives us a special insight into this different definition of Latino. So I hope you enjoyed that video. In the future, I will continue to discuss languages with more fun false cognates and maybe continuing to talk about different language puns from international languages um, that we may encounter like in our daily lives so and that way you may not stumble upon them accidentally, along with how we can incorporate them into our vocabulary as well as loan words. Now, unfortunately, the backlash I got from this little video was extremely menacing. And because of this, I decided to quit TikTok entirely because the internet is full of people who get to be cruel for free. And in fact, I wanted to include this part two to this video about Taino syntax and grammatical structure to prove to these people that they were right. You guys were right about Latino being a false cognate between the Taino Borike Nike language of the indigenous people of the Caribbean and Latin the Roman language, but you were wrong in assuming that I fell for that false cognate. It was more like making a pun. I was not spreading this information. I understand how linguistics work because I study them for fun. Now, I can't expect people to understand all of the little synchronicities of etymology that I was utilizing in such a short span window of 15 seconds, which was meant to be cute and not literal, of course. And in a way, it's unreasonable to expect ordinary people that don't study linguistics or cultural anthropology to get it in such a short time span that I was using a false cognate as a loan word by utilizing Taino pluralization that creates a false homophone. <laughs> I'm a huge nerd, okay? <laughs> like, let me elaborate for you. Let me give you a good visualization of all the language books that I have, not just the Taino books, because it's just like three of them. Let me show you all the language books that I have. Shout out to the language nerds! So as a baseline, I'm native speaker in English and Spanish and advanced fluency in French just from opting out of it in high school. So because of my familiarity with romance languages, I got the complete idiot's guide to learning Latin and I tutored Latin for the Upward Bound program for high school kids. That later made Italian super easy, so I have a variety of different Italian books and dictionaries. I also really enjoyed this book, The Unfolding of Language, which talks about Proto-Indo-European language groups. I like this one, The Dictionary of Word Origins. It's a pretty good resource, but it also gives like pretty good context. And then we have my non-Latin or non-Romance language books, A Practical Grammar for Classical Hebrew. Um, I haven't dove into this yet, but I want to. 
I also got this sign language book from a friend, but I find that books aren't really helpful for trying to learn ASL because it's such a visual medium. A written format doesn't help very much, so I would definitely recommend using the Life Print website where they have so many videos and I just wish I had more time to learn sign language honestly. And then we have my Japanese books, um, a simple Japanese to English dictionary for vocabulary. Um, I have a Genki workbook, we have a Remembering the Kanji book, a few hiragana worksheets, and then the only way to really study Japanese is just to write it out like crazy. <laughs> it's gonna take you years anyway! <laughs> but I am determined. Oh yeah, and these are my notes from when I was in college, not studying languages like scholarly, but just doing it like as a hobby. <laughs> Where each section of like this five sectioned college ruled notebook was a completely different language that I was studying. Oh my gosh, like I was trying to pick up Portuguese, but the pronunciation was really difficult compared to Spanish, I found. Like, it's a romance language, but pronouncing it was really different for me and for my tongue to try to do. And then I tried to learn Arabic. I need to hop back into this, because I loved learning Arabic. And I have this Rosetta Stone program for Thai, but the thing is, we got it to communicate with the local Burmese community where I live, but they were Karen people, like the ethnicity from Southeast Asia, who spoke Karen, like that dialect. So I wasn't even able to use this. <laughs> Plus, I'm looking into studying the Cyrillic alphabet to learn Russian and Ukrainian to help a friend overseas. Like, it's gotta be like 15 years of my life now. Like, if I sit down and like think about it, I just am fascinated with languages like everything from etymology and the origin of words to like sociology how we interact with one another and how we use words slang and regional differences accents oh my god i could go on and on about accents and just everything having to do with linguistics it's my jam okay <laughs> so i hope that's been illuminating and this is why I want to cast a wider lens for this YouTube channel to include cultural anthropology as an umbrella term and all the different areas of study as well. So not only linguistics, um, we want to talk about sociology and different cultural customs. Uh, we don't want to focus just on one region like Latin America, even though that's what I specialize in for mythology and folklore for the indigenous community there as well. But I want to cast a wider lens because it's absolutely fascinating for me. So not only as a hobby do I love studying this, but scholarly as well. And ojalá, maybe a master's degree. And I also hope that this has helped people online because as a collective and community we often make the common mistake of assuming a lot about a person by what we perceive so by example of what we post online it's like trying to paint a picture of a person by looking through a keyhole online communities are often connected by common interests but we're still complete strangers and we shouldn't jump to conclusions or blast somebody online uh, using outrage culture when we don't know their character and we don't see the full picture. Now, the brick wall comes when people refuse to see that person's perspective by perpetuating false claims, uh, utilizing ad hominem attacks, refusing any contrary evidence because people are so firmly supplanted in their confirmation bias about somebody's character, someone who is a stranger online essentially. And it won't matter what you say, they're already committed to misunderstanding you regardless if you reply. And even if you do reply, that'll just be used as even more ammo. If love is blind, hate is deaf. So when it comes to this whole Latino false cognate fiasco, um, it was very disheartening for me. And I feel like these people that continue perpetuating outrage culture are completely missing the point. And they make poor judgment calls, which actually informs the public more about their own character rather than the fictitious one that they've created about me. So I hope in the future that any sort of contentious issue can be dealt with in private simply by directly messaging me. 
I'm sure that we can have a mutual conversation and settle the matter privately. So just know that if someone is being unreasonable online, you're not responsible for their interpretation of a misunderstanding and you're not responsible to clarify any further. It's best instead to clarify the subject matter and allow them to extrapolate from that. As for my YouTube channel, I apologize. I know I post extremely erratically, so thank you to my subscribers for still following me. Just know that behind the scenes, I am still working on things. It's just that it takes a very long time to research this stuff, and I wanna make sure that when I do post the videos that they're perfect, that I don't need to do any follow-up explanations. It's all very concise, even if it's a long video. Um, but in real life, I'm extremely busy, not only with work, but also with family matters and with my future plans being up in the air at the moment. So life is crazy behind the scenes, but just know that in the future, the direction of this YouTube channel is going to be about cultural anthropology overall. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely come along for the ride. As for my other social media platforms, I'm completely cutting off TikTok because I'm really done with their social culture as a platform. It's really riddled with vocenticity, posturing, and outrage culture. So I just, I cannot reason with these type of people who are like online trolls or they, they cannot get a proper explanation within such a tight frame window because the videos have to be so short. So I think that YouTube is a better platform because then I can lengthen the videos to whatever is needed. I've also decided to quit Patreon, at least to quit the content for Patreon because I just don't have the time. Like I said, time is in very short supply in my real life at the moment because uh, I have just a lot of things that I'm juggling. So if you wanna support this channel, you can definitely still donate to the Patreon channel, and then when time allows, I will be able to upload more videos there. So I apologize to any subscribers if you're waiting for more content um, at the moment. It's just gonna have to be irregular um, for the time being. But in the future, if you do wanna support my research and um, future videos about the Taino people, for example, then definitely consider donating to the Patreon. Or I also have a PayPal that is in my link tree below in the description. And then lastly, I'm only on Instagram as a platform to display my artwork that I'm currently working on, like an online gallery. So in order to display the tattoos and paintings and illustrations that I'm working on right now, um, along with like a whole lot of various long-term projects that I'm working on just behind the scenes. It's just a matter of time before I'm able to properly work on those and then subsequently upload them. So right now, when it comes to the social media sphere, I'm just sticking to YouTube for video essays and Instagram as an art gallery. If you'd like to support this channel, consider subscribing, liking this video, and share it with anyone who you think would be interested in learning about the Taino language, syntax, and grammar. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye!